Welcome to Baptism Sunday. Let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry? Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you.
God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, he is with us today. Let's keep worshiping. The Lord leads us out right now. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God all my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good every breath that I am made oh I will sing of the good God is so good. 
and it is so good to be with you today. Why don't you say hello to the folks around you, greet one another. Welcome to the high school, junior high departments today. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Robert, and I'm one of the pastors here on the team at WAC. I want to wish you a very good morning. Uh, if you know, if you're, if you're new, we would love a chance to say hi and to help you get connected here at WAC. You can do that by going by Guest Central in our lobby or by clicking New here if you're online. You know, Next Steps is a wonderful way for you to take the next step here at WAC. It's a four-week class, and you learn about the history of WAC and the story that God is writing here and how you and your life is an incredible part of that story as well. Our next session starts next week, and so you can head to the website after the service and sign up today for next steps. Our sports ministry is putting on a golf tournament fundraiser at Candlewood Country Club on Monday, September the 25th. Now, I love golf, but we have a bit of a dysfunctional relationship because I don't think golf loves me. I give golf my money, my time, my affection, and golf gives me out of bounds and in the water. But there's hope even for dysfunctional relationships, and you might see a turnaround at the tournament. I'm hoping you do. So this is a great opportunity for you to bring some friends, to make new friends, and maybe grab some bragging rights. So some of you might say, I don't play golf. Well, you're very smart. Well, I don't play golf, but how can I still be involved? How can I help the sports ministry here at WAC? Well, we have sponsorships available. So if you'd like to head to the, uh, for more details, you go to the sports ministry booth that's gathered out there in the patio and find out more about that. Now. Our mission here at WAC is to see that everyone who calls WAC their, their church home, that they would gather in worship, that's what we're doing today, that they would, we would grow in uh, the, our community, and that we would go and serve the world, those three things. Well, right now, we are ready to launch this next season of small groups, is where we really grow in community. It's life-changing. So that we have a group for everyone, no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, there's a group that fits where you are right now and can help you continue in your growth process. We have a team outside in the lobby ready to talk to you about, uh, ask, ask, answer questions about what group might be right for me. Also, you can go online and see a list of all of the groups that are available. So I hope you do that. Now, last week, we gave away this lovely shirt, We Not Me. The demand was so great that we ran out of shirts, but we have ordered a whole new batch, and they're out there right now so that everybody here at WAC gets, has an opportunity to get one of these free shirts. So if you're still needing a shirt, stop by the table right outside this room and grab one after, after the service. Now, if you got a shirt last week, don't be all, well, that was last week's shirt. I'm going to get this week's shirt. No, it's the same shirt. Don't be like that. But wait, there's more. We also have keychains that we gave away. So yeah, I know, I know. If you act right now, you gotta act the next three minutes. You get a keychain, especially for educators and students. So please, please grab one so you can take this message with you wherever you go. But there's more. No, there's not more, I'm just joking. All right. So <clears throat> on Thursday, we had close to 700 women in this room and we had the most incredible evening of, of, of women following this theme of leading the way, of, of following Jesus in an amazing way. I mean, there's been stories about how the Spirit moved that night, how connections were made, where, where relationships were cultivated. And, and as these women, this room full of women were pressing into Jesus. Now, I was on campus for a meeting on Thursday. So I snuck in here, even though I'm a boy. And man, the room was like electric. So it's wonderful. So as we, as we turn now to our time of giving, you know, giving is when we as an intentional community gather together and, and, and celebrate what Jesus is doing. 
and whether it be in the men's ministry that took place a couple weeks ago, the women's ministry, the youth ministry, our recovery ministry, wherever. And one of the ways that we get to partner with Jesus in what he's doing is through our giving. It's what he uses to, to, to continue moving forward in this community through this church. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing in this community of faith called WAC. And we pray, Lord God, that you would continue to bless, continue to open up opportunities. And that, Lord God, our tithes and our offerings that we bring, we pray that you would transform them into lives being changed, hearts being transformed by the incredible, passionate love of Jesus. Amen. Ushers, come ahead. I've been coming to WAC for uh, almost a year now and just really feel strengthened in my faith and um, really my commitment to Jesus Christ. And I just am so glad I got to participate in the baptism today and, and show it publicly. For me, it while leading up today, the last couple months, I felt like I come to the end of my own strength and I just want to give my life over to Christ completely. It was for one of the first times in my life, it felt like something that, that, that was right for me. I kind of was a lost sheep for a while. When I met my wife and, and the struggles we've overcome together, I can see now that committing to the Lord is the only way to move forward and pursue a much bigger, more important relationship with God. I'm so excited. I, I want to be an example for my husband, for my kids, my family, my friends. It just felt like the right time, and I'm so grateful I did it. It's been a long time uh, coming for this day. I wanted my children to see me get baptized. Uh, you know, I'm often talking about Jesus in the home, and I wanted them to see, like actually see something that they could experience that's outside of the home, but actually in our church, where they would see that I'm 100% committed to this, and it's a part of our lives now. Since I've been coming here, my life has been changing incrementally ever since. I am committed to following Christ and I'm in it for life and there's no reason why I shouldn't be. I wanted to publicly confess my faith for Jesus Christ and I wanted to do it in front of my, my church family here at WAC. Well, welcome again, everyone. We're so glad you're joining us today. Welcome to those of you in the room, on the patio online. And can you all join me in saying welcome to our junior high and high school students again who are with us today? Glad you guys are here. If we haven't met before, my name's John, and we've been studying the Bible in this series the last couple of weeks called We Not Me, discovering that we weren't meant to live these isolated lives that are just about ourselves. God actually designed us to be part of interdependent communities with other people who we can know and encourage and bless. Last week, we talked about how we aren't just made for community, we're made from community. And today, as we gather together as a community, we get to celebrate, and I wanna spend a couple moments with you talking about one of the most sacred and significant acts that we do together as the body of Jesus. And that is an act that's called baptism. Baptism is one of those significant sacred moments, not just for someone in their life with God, but for an entire church. And today, at the end of this message, we're gonna go back into a time of worship, and if today's the day that you want to take the step of being baptized, you're gonna have that opportunity in just a few moments. Uh, baptism is really sacred, but can we just start off and admit, it's kind of strange too at the same time. I mean, is there anywhere else in life you go to where there's a, a group of adults standing in a bathtub together dunking each other? And that's kind of weird, right? And then it's not just like we're gonna dunk each other, but people get dunked in the water and then they come out and they're like excited to get dunked. I watch my kids in the pool when they like pull each other down. They're not excited when they come back up out of the water. But it's not just like they're excited, it's everybody in the room is excited. People are cheering for someone who just got dunked under the water. And then what's also strange to me is the emotion. Sometimes I see folks and they'll we'll enter the baptism waters and just tears streaming down their faces. Tears of joy, tears of gratitude, tears of just a story that's brought them to this point. What's that about? Why do we celebrate baptism so exuberantly? By the time 
we finish, in just a couple of moments, I hope you're clear on that. Why are there so many tears and cheers when we celebrate baptism? I want you in just the next couple of moments to be so clear at what baptism is about. And for some of you, you've already been baptized in the past. I hope this message is one that reminds you, that's the decision I made. And wow, maybe I didn't even realize that was the decision and all that entailed back then, but, but I'm so glad I did. And then for others, if you haven't taken that step again, in a few moments, there's gonna be an opportunity to do that before you leave today. Uh, now, baptism is sacred and significant for all of us because baptism is the gospel in three-dimensional form. It's a moment where an entire church is reminded, here's how Jesus feels about you. Here's what Jesus has done for you. When you go under the water, Jesus died. When you're under the water, buried. And then when you come out of the water, God gives you new life, not because you deserve it, but because he loves you and wants to give this to you. And I know it can get very convoluted and confusing sometimes. So because baptism is an image of what Jesus does, I wanna give you three images from the Bible that help you really understand this is what baptism is about. This is why people cheer and why there's the tears. So if you have your Bible, I'm gonna start off in Romans chapter six to the first image that describes baptism, and that is an image of burial. The Apostle Paul describes baptism as actually someone being buried. Listen to these words from Romans chapter six, starting in verse three. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were buried into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Paul also uses the same language in Colossians chapter two, verse 12. He says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. You see, before there's a resurrection for Jesus, first there's a death and a burial. And this word baptize hints at that. Baptize, uh, baptize comes from an English or a Greek word baptizo, which sometimes we think, well, that's kind of like a sentimental church word, right? Baptizo can actually describe a physical burial, sometimes a violent burial. When there was a ship that was actually sinking in the sea, sometimes they would use this term to talk about what's happening to the boat. This is a term that could describe what happens when someone passes and their remains are put in the ground. Baptizo is not a sentimental church word. It captures a dramatic act, uh, sometimes a violent act where something is buried. And that's happening in baptism. Well, what's being buried in baptism? Paul puts it like this. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. Now it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. Baptism is a picture of your old self, the sinful past, the broken parts of you that you could never fix, the things that you regret, all of that, the, the sin that you inherited from Adam and Eve, that's buried, that's the past, that's actually wiped away. And when you realize that that's what baptism is, it means something so much more significant. A man who experienced this in his life was a guy named Samuel Houston. He was an American general, a statesman in the 1800s, and he's the one who this, the capital of, of Texas, Houston, was named after. Uh, he played an important role in the Texas Revolution. He served twice as the president of the Republic of Texas, but he lived a quite colorful life. Uh, one of his favorite nicknames people would call him was Big Drunk because he was big and he liked to drink. And then after he'd drink, he would just love to fight and get in brawls and beat people up. V lived a very, very colorful life. Uh, and then things began to change when Houston married his third wife, Margaret. And if you look at Margaret, you think she's a lot younger than him. She was a lot younger than him. But she prayed for Houston for 14 years until suddenly on November 19th, 1854, Houston turned his life to Jesus and was baptized in the cold little rocky creek in Texas. He had three pastors there to baptize him because he really needed to be baptized. <laughs> and uh, after he was baptized in that cold water, I love what historians retell about, about that. There's a plaque there at this creek. And here's what happened. His friends looked at him and said, General, your sins have been forgiven. 
To which he replied, if that's the case, God help the fish down below. (laughs) Because Houston realized, man, there's a lot in my past. There's a lot that needs to be buried. And in baptism, it's signifying that's been buried. That's done with. You're a new person. A few, few months ago, we were about to celebrate baptisms in the coming weeks here and at WAC, and I had one of the gentlemen who was part of our church come and say, hey, John, I know you don't always baptize. Would you be willing to baptize me? And I thought, wow, that's an honor. Of course I would baptize you. And then he said, well, I have a special request. He said, I'm a, a swimmer, and I love the water, and I can hold my breath for about two minutes underwater. So when you baptize me, I want you to hold me down for a while. I I really want to take in this experience. I want to just think about what it means. And so right away I told him, there is no way I'm holding you down for two minutes. Not one minute. Our safety team would jump in the water and rescue you. So um, I'll try to hold you down for a little bit longer than normal. And he said, fine. So I was thinking like five seconds. Like I'll hold him down for five seconds. Five seconds versus a minute. If you've ever held someone down for five seconds, so we get in the baptismal, put him down, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. And by the time I got the three, one of the other staff members outside the baptismal was like, John. And I like just pulled him up real quick because three seconds is an eternity when you're holding someone in there. It, it was kind of an odd request, but here's what I loved about it. This gentleman realized in that moment, this is a significant act taking place where there are some things in my past that have been defeated because of Jesus and they need to be buried in the water. There's a past life that's buried beneath the waters of baptism. And friends, it's not because the waters of baptism are magical. The water doesn't have special power, but they're representing the power of Jesus. And he's the one, because of his death, We have this assurance that our past is paid for, our sins are forgiven, and the old is gone and the new comes. And friends, I think sometimes when we look at baptism, we don't realize that's what it's representing. Sometimes in America, it seems like baptism is one of those things we kind of shrug at, like, ah, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't do it, which is so odd, because when you go to other parts of the world where there are people from different religions all living in the same villages, when someone's baptized, Man, people from other religions, they understand. That's significant. It's so significant that often in Muslim and Hindu countries, when someone is baptized and becomes a follower of Jesus, they will bring suitcases with them to their baptisms. Because when they are baptized, they get disowned by their family, sometimes kicked out of their villages. There's an organization called A2 that works in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, And as they're working with Christians there, when someone makes a decision and says, I want to be baptized, they ask those folks seven questions. Here are the questions. Number one, are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? Because that's probably going to happen when you leave the religion you grew up in. Number two, are you willing to lose your job? Because there's very likely they're going to not want you at at that job anymore. Number three, are you willing to go to the village of those who persecute you to forgive them and to share the love of Christ with them even when they're mean to you? Because you're going to have to do that. Number four, are you willing to give an offering to the Lord? Because this is sacrificial. Number five, are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith? Number six, are you willing to go to prison? Number seven, are you willing to die for Jesus? And those seven questions, I think, serve as sobering reminders of this is significant. This is an act of, of burying, of saying, I'm, I'm humbling and surrendering myself. And that means my past is paid for, but that means, God, my future is yours. Sometimes baptism is called a watery grave where you're buried under the water. I want to take a quick tangent real quick, talking about this burial part. Sometimes people will ask me when when we talk about baptism, they'll say, John, I was sprinkled as a child. Do I ever really need to be baptized beneath the water now? And my answer to that is, I think it's such a beautiful thing that if you were a child, your parents, they, they, they have this faith that they sprinkled you. And I think the beautiful thing of wanting to identify you within the faith of Jesus is incredible. But I, I, what I will say is this. I think the sprinkling as children and this being buried under the water, those are two different things. You see, the word baptizo that we get baptized from literally means to bury, to dip, to plunge beneath the water, or to immerse. 
And there's actually a different Greek word that means to sprinkle, to cleanse by sprinkling. That's rontizo. Rontizo was used when the Jewish priests would go to the temple and they would sprinkle the blood of the bulls or the goats at the altar there. And in my opinion, the fact that there's like two different words, there's two different acts we're talking about here means that these aren't the same thing. And, and I think when you look at what baptizo means, when you see what Paul's talking about, this burial in Romans chapter six, you realize, no, there's something about being put under, making the decision, I'm gonna be buried in the water representing the burial of what Jesus did for me. And, and if you're wondering, but John, then why, why is there sprinkling and immersion? Like, what, why, why does that exist? I think some of the confusion came from the fact that the word baptize is not a translation from Greek, is a transliteration from Greek. Now, if you're not an English nerd, I've lost you right now, so just lean in for a moment. When you read your Bible, this, the New Testament, if you're reading it in English or Spanish, it was originally written, most of it, in Koine Greek, which means when you're reading English words, those are translated from the Greek words. Well, you come across certain words sometimes, though, that they're not translated, they're transliterated. And what that means is scholars looked at words like baptizo, and they said, rather than translate it, at some point somebody said, let's just make up an English word, baptize, which then, for the centuries, has made it less clear of what in the world are we actually talking about. And so if our Bibles didn't transliterate baptizo, but they translated it, we would probably understand this a little better. And also, by the way, John the Baptist would have a very different name if that happened. He would not be known as John the Baptist. He would be John the Plunger or, or John the Dipper or John the Barrier, which I think would be a really cool pro wrestling name. So <laughs> instead of translating it, though, we transliterated it, and I think it would... If, if we understood this is, I'm being plunged under the water, I'm being buried under the water, this would, this would help us in our understanding. And, and also we do know from Christian history, sprinkling came in a couple hundred years after the New Testament was written, after the, the early church began, and it often came in because it, practice of burying someone under the water sometimes was impossible. They didn't have the water around. It was very inconvenient, especially with young children when they started baptizing young children. So sprinkling can be a beautiful thing, but there is something about the burial of what baptism is. Bapti ba burials are a lot of things, but they are not convenient. They're humbling, and they're pointing to the fact that your, your past is paid for by Jesus. Well, the second picture I want you to get of baptism isn't just a burial, but it is a cleansing. It's a washing. You see, we understand washing all throughout our lives when we have dirt on our bodies, when we have stains on our clothes, we use water as a cleansing, cleansing agent. And so in scripture, baptism is used with that in mind. Now, baptism doesn't represent a physical cleansing. It represents a spiritual cleansing. And it's not made possible, again, by the water. There's an old hymn that says, what can wash away my sins? And then it says, nothing but my baptism. No, is that what it says? No. What does it say? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus is the only one that can forgive and cleanse, not just your body, but the deepest parts of your soul that you can't even see with your eyes. And in baptism, it's a representation of that taking place. And friends, we all need that. Sometimes we don't like to look at things when they're filthy or dirty, but, but they still are. There's a news report I heard about this past week that there are a number of really cool hotels in Las Vegas that look like a great place to stay at, but suddenly there's these big bed bug infestations that are being found out there. So if you're heading to Vegas soon, check if your hotel's on that list. Um, but we've kind of always known, like there's been these studies where TV, TV crews will go into hotel rooms that look really nice, and they'll say, hey, do you want to stay here? And people are like, yeah, this looks really nice. And then they'll take in those ultraviolet lights to expose all types of bacteria and germs on the comforter and the walls and the TV remote. Always wash your TV remote, right? Here's what's interesting about this to me. Most of us, we feel fine staying in the room as long as we don't see what's there. It looks fine, but as soon as we can see the, the filthiness, the dirtiness, the germs, suddenly it's like, I'm, I don't want to be in that place. And I think instinctively, a lot of us in our lives, we do the same thing. We, we, we don't want to look closely at some of the, the deeper things in our life that are, that are sick, that are not okay. 
and we want to live in a way that we just kind of acknowledge, I'm, I'm okay, and then something happens. I don't know what it is. Maybe you go to a church service. Maybe you're reading your Bible. Maybe you hear a song. Maybe you have a conflict, and some, suddenly you realize there's, there's something that's not okay in me. Everything is not oh, fine, and, and I need some sort of healing. I need some sort of forgiveness in me, and we often want to avoid that reality, but there's times where you can't avoid it anymore. And the scriptures make like there's only one thing that can really cleanse you deep in those stains on our souls. And, and this is what John says. If you claim to be without sin, without those stains, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, from anything in you that maybe even others don't see, but God sees, those stains on our souls, things that I try to rationalize or you try to rationalize. You get in a fight with a loved one and you say mean things and you just, you can rationalize, well, I, we just have personality differences between us or we just had a communication breakdown. Maybe, but there's also a stain on your soul that you can't heal, that needs to be forgiven. There's you need love to infect your soul so you can actually give love back up in a hard situation. Or, or maybe there's some of us who we like to look at other people and their stains. And we would like to think, oh, what's, 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 what's that person doing? I wonder, what's he, what is he going through? And, and we judge them and not realizing, hey, if you just took a look inward, you'd realize there's some stains maybe of self-righteousness and judgment I need to deal with in here. I bring this all up because the Apostle Peter connects that cleansing with baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, you are saved not through this water. You are saved through the sacrifice, the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what saves you and makes you clean. And baptism becomes a picture that captures that truth that reality that I can have a clear conscience about the things I've done. I can know those are buried and I am forgiven. There might still be consequences in life that we deal with, but I can know, hey, with God, he looks at me and sees me as righteous now like Jesus. And I don't think a lot of us live with that. I think a lot of us, we live under this cloud of shame, shame over my past, shame over my inadequacies, shame over my doubts. And with that shame, what it causes us to do often is, is to pull away from God and to isolate from others, to weigh us down in the present, make us feel hopeless about the future. And yet what the scriptures teach us is Jesus neutralizes the shame. He cleanses us of our sin. He gives us a bright future ahead. He sets us free. And friends, baptism, baptism points to that. It's interesting in the early church, before the cleansing took place, first there was a conviction. If you, you read in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, the early Christians, the Holy Spirit comes on and essentially fills them, baptizes them, and then they start speaking in other languages. A crowd in Jerusalem gathers, and Peter gives his first sermon. And after Peter preaches, it says this in Acts 2.37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. That means they were convicted. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? See, these people, they were convinced that Jesus was God's son. He was the savior. They're convicted of the guilt of their sin. And now they want to know, what do we do? Listen to Peter's answer. Now repent. That means turn, change directions in your life, and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then I love this. He says this in verse 39. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off and all whom the Lord will call. In other words, this promise is not just for people 2,000 years ago. It's for us in 2023. If you're sitting there wondering, hey, could I still be cleansed? Could my past still be buried? Could I have that? You're part of that all who are far off, friends. You're far off culturally from those people. You're far off geographically from those people. You're far off in, in time from those people. But some of you, you might even be far off from God right now. And you feel like, does God really still want me? And Peter is saying, yes, that is a promise for you. What do you need to do? Turn to God, receive grace. Don't try to make, figure this out on your own. Turn to him, receive grace, and be baptized in the name of Jesus. You see, 
Baptism can be captured in the picture of burial, and it can be captured in the picture of cleansing. Here's the final picture I want you to get. It can be captured in a picture of an intimate connection with God and with each other. The, this, the language is similar to the covenant of marriage that it's used. Uh, throughout scripture, when this husband and wife relationship happens in marriage, there's a oneness that is described. Uh, there's a Hebrew word that's used called dod. And dod can literally be like, thought of as the mingling of souls. And what I want you to notice in Romans 6, when Paul talks about baptism, there's this union, this connection, mingling that happens. Let me run through this quickly. Verse 3, don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ? Verse 4, for we were buried with him. Verse 5, but if we have been united with him in death, then we're united also in his resurrection. Verse 6, we are crucified with him him and then verse 7 we're set free because he died for us verse 8 now if we died with Christ we believe we will also live with him you hear the connecting language here there's this connective thing that happens in baptism you connect with God and each other in this really sacred way a bonding thing if you've ever uh, baked a cake before from scratch, you know there's a number of ingredients you'll need. Uh, you'll need milk and sh- flour and sugar and cocoa and a number of things, whatever you want to bake your cake. But one of the elements you need that you can't leave out is the eggs. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not a baker by nature, so it's not like intuitive. Like if, if I was baking a cake and someone's like, we're out of eggs, there's a part of me that would say, yeah, let's just go for it anyways. Because I don't want my cake to, to taste like eggs. But those of you who do this pretty often, you know, cakes don't have eggs, so it has an egg flavor. Eggs serve as a bonding agent for the cake. Egg proteins, when they're mixed in and they're cooked, they end up binding the other ingredients together, giving strength and stability to the cake. So without the eggs in the recipe, the cake structure would essentially fall apart. Eggs serve to bring together all the ingredients. And friends, that connectivity, I think, is what baptism gets described as in Scripture. Baptism is this bonding moment where we remember that Jesus is our Savior who died for us. He's the only one who can really bury our past and forgive us. And he's the only one who can give us new life. This is a three-dimensional living example of what our faith is about. Jesus died you're under the water. He's buried you're, when you're down under the water after you go in. And then when you come out, it represents you have a new life. And this new life is connected to God through his Holy Spirit and each other in a way you could have never had without it. I, I share this all because my prayer today is first off, for those of you, if you've been baptized in the past, you were not just baptized into just a relationship with God. You realize I was baptized into a family. I'm connected to other people now and I can let my past go and I can know that I'm forgiven and I can walk not with shame but with grace and freedom in this journey with these other folks. But but my other prayer is for those of you who have not taken this step yet today to be obedient to be baptized before you leave today. Some of you, this might sound like an intimidating thing but literally if you're on the patio If you're in this room, to my right, on this side of the room, there's a hallway. There's a big sign that just says baptism. And there's going to be a group of people who are going to be there in just a moment to walk you through the process to get ready to pray for you and then to lead you to be baptized. And they have towels. They have T-shirts. This past, the previous, in the past two services, there have been people who just came. They weren't planning to do this, but they felt like God's convicting my heart. I want to take this step today. And maybe that might be you today. And uh, while that's happening, our worship team is going to be coming up in just a moment. They're going to lead us in some final songs. And if you're not being baptized, you get to cheer on those folks who are taking this step in their faith right here. If you're, if you're thinking, man, that sounds interesting, but I don't, I don't need to do it to be saved, right? Like, it's just a suggestion to be baptized. Can I remind you, baptism was demonstrated by Jesus, commanded to be part of the Great Commission this is not just a suggestion. This is, this is an important moment in your journey and in the journey of those around you for you to publicly profess your faith. I know for some of you, it might be uncomfortable to be in front of other people, and I get that. But I think, again, this is one of those moments where you confess God before others, and Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna confess you before my Father. Don't be ashamed to do that. 
If, if you're being led to do that this today, I wanna encourage you to take that step in just a moment after I pray. Now, if you're here today and you're thinking, my parents baptized me when I was a child, like, can I still do this now? I hope you realize by t- right now, baptism is not a decision any parent can make for a child to be immersed in the water in that way. That's, that's something you choose yourself. And I think it's so special you were sprinkled, but today's the day where you can go public with the burial and resurrection of Jesus for you to fully surrender. Maybe some of you today are thinking, I, you know, I, I wanna do it, but I'm kind of just waiting for a sign that it'll be the right time. Can I challenge you that, hey, part of doing this is it's an act of faith. It's an act where you might not fully have all the answers to everything or be fully convinced on everything, but if you've made Jesus your savior, it pleases God to take that step of faith. Finally, maybe some of you are here today and you're thinking, I I will do it once I clean up my life. There's a lot of religions in the world that say you gotta clean your life up to come to God. That is not what Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches you come as you are. You're welcome to come and when you come to him, he forgives you and he cleanses you and he gives you new life. You come in the messiness of where you are today. If that's what God's calling you to do, man named Paul, uh, his name was Saul before that. He, he was persecuting Christians, watching them get murdered, thrown in prison. One day Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and Paul goes blind. His life was turned upside down. And then this man named Ananias comes to Paul and helps, helps Paul kind of find his footing again. And when Paul was still messy, I love these words from Ananias. Ananias said to him, now what are you waiting for? Get up, Paul, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on Jesus' name. I love that. Paul was still a mess. He hadn't figured everything out. But Ananias says, what are you waiting for? Today's the day, Paul. I don't know if today's the day for you, but if it is, I challenge you, take that step and be be obedient. Would you bow and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though sin stained our souls, even though, God, because of our past, some of us felt weighed down, that there is freedom because Jesus came and he gave his life for us. And God, right now I pray that every single person today would leave lighter knowing that grace, knowing that their past is buried, their sins are washed away, and they are now connected to you. And just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you've never prayed that prayer before, to confess, to say, Jesus, I want to receive that grace. Just tell him. Just say, God, I don't have it all figured out and I don't have it all together, but I believe Jesus did and that he gave his life to forgive my sins. So today, forgive me, cleanse me. I surrender my life to you. The old is gone, bring on the new. Jesus, that's our prayer today. Now, would you be blessed in the moments to come In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, again, right now, if you wanna take that step to be baptized, there's gonna be a team right over here. You can walk down this hallway and we'll get you prepared. And the rest of us, we get to worship and cheer together, amen.
cross is my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, be the God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, and your love is still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, be the God forever.
All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express Oh my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one song, I've got just one move, with my arms stretched wide, yeah, we will worship you, oh, so I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, cause all that I
Church, we've got a, f- a few more baptisms, as you can see, and uh, we love to have you stay and cheer, like right now. I realize some of you might have kids in the kids' ministry right now, and I would encourage, if that's you, and maybe you're not waiting on someone to be baptized, go get your kids and bring them back, just to to keep celebrating, but I want you to know if you have kids you need to go get, go get everyone else. Let's keep worshiping and let's cheer, keep cheering for these folks here today.
And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. Like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight is wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how.
spirit changes from the inside we're overwhelmed by your love for us and in our lives spirit changes from the inside
church, I think there's one more. So we're going to celebrate with the biggest cheer and applause. So would you stand up to your feet right now as we worship? Sorry, Lord. Thank you guys for staying and cheering. God bless you. We hope you have a great week. Thanks, everybody.